agenda wise so this is a hacking session there is no structure it's deliberate deliberate there are no slides either really i mean there are, i have a couple of but but, but i'm not going to focus on slides at all um so i'm gonna you know start from my blog entry um what i wrote and uh and how do you troubleshoot or how do you measure where your io time is going really and um and um and so on anyway so um and i will i'll close powerpoint so it doesn't bother me here so here is a um and i'm, I'm gonna keep the font size like it is so um so it's um because otherwise i need to scroll around too much so um move closer to the screen move your head closer to the screen if you if you cannot read that okay let's get started so i will do a brief walkthrough of um of this blog so i'm not going to just read through everything you can you probably already have read through it yourself but uh but anyway so um let me scroll let me start from this angle so because i'm not writing so if i go to uh so i bought an amd threadripper pro machine just as, as one of my lab machines and it has um as i mentioned somewhere earlier um you see it's not only about cpu cores i mean you can get the 64 core uh, cpu i was cheap i bought the 16 core version of this um, threadripper but since it's it's not the regular threadripper it's the threadripper pro uh, you know workstation version so it actually is more similar to amd's epic servers server cpus you know so they have uh, one cpu socket has eight memory channels you know, like uh, when you buy a regular sort of low-end or mid-range PC, it will have two memory chan channels, uh, channels, and you know, a bit some bigger ones have maybe four. And Intel current uh, current uh, CPUs, what you can buy from Intel, they can go uh, like server CPUs. They can go up to six memory channels. So you have to have you have to buy a NUMA server with multiple sockets if you want like twelve or you know twenty four memory channels you know six per CPU. I think Intel is working on an eight um, eight CPU version as well, eight channel version as well. But anyway, so this was a nice surprise that I could buy a fairly cheap, um, relatively cheap compared to other stuff. You know, I can talk about the price later. Uh, you can buy a, f a relatively cheap um, uh, you know machine uh, with um, with eight memory channels and of course i have to populate this you know the memory slots now in the mother on the motherboard as well because you know if, if i put only one dim in there and seven sockets seven slots are free then you know you're not going to be able to use all eight memory channels right so so uh um so uh you know but anyway that was awesome right so um and also this cpu supports PCIe 4, uh, you know, the latest currently available PCI, you know, uh, peripheral um, uh, protocol and, and, and hardware, right? And it has 100, 128 PCIe 4 lanes, right? So again, you know, if, you, if you're not uh, thinking about computers like this, um, it will help you know, go to the end of this blog entry. I will actually, this is, this is in my summary. Computers are networks, right? So, uh, you know, so uh, you have a, um, if you buy a cheap computer, you will have a CPU and you have a crappy network between your disks and the CPU. And you only have like two memory channels in the, instead of eight memory channels. So the network bandwidth, between the CPU and memory, between the CPU and PCIe devices and so on, the network bandwidth will be lower, right? So, but if you wanna build a high performance system that can feed your CPUs fast enough, right? Then, then you have to worry about these things. So, you know, so you have to start thinking that computers are networks. It's not only about how many megahertz or gigahertz your CPU clock is, I mean, if you had if you had some ridiculously fast CPU with let's say you know let's say you have a CPU with 64 cores but if you only have one memory channel in use then you cannot feed the CPU fast enough you know so so you know if you want to build a high throughput balanced system you have to think about all of these things 
right? Okay, so that's uh, a bit of intro. Um, and um, uh, so, and if you look into specifications, um, if you use, let's say you, you install some sort of a card which uses four slots, four channels or four lanes on of this PCIe 4 um, uh, speed, then that would give you close to eight gigabytes, not gigabits, eight gigabytes of transfer speed. So it's a, it's a, a bit under two gigabits per lane. And if you have such a card, you know, you can use, uh, uh, do eight gigabytes of transfer from, you know, from your card uh, to the CPUs, um, assuming that you don't hit some other bottlenecks, you know, first, right? And um, and and it's worth noting that modern CPUs, um, you know, even even C even the server CPUs you bought five years ago, right? So, and the PCIe lanes are connected directly to the CPU. So you may remember from past that there are some extra chipsets and front sets, front set, uh, front side buses and and south bridge controllers and all your disk I/O went through some some other chip on the motherboard somewhere. In, and this is not the case anymore because it's just too slow, right? So modern CPUs have both memory channels connected directly to the CPU itself, right? And PCIe lanes go directly to the CPU as well. So therefore, when this particular CPU supports 128 PCIe 4 lanes, that means that this CPU can handle, in theory, about 250 gigabytes per second transfer in both ways, if all lanes were somehow magically fully used, right? So, you know, but, but sometimes physical limitations of how many slots you have on the motherboard and so on, that, that can cause trouble, right? Or not cause trouble, that, you know, you may have limitations there. Anyway, so that's, modern CPUs are ridiculously fast, modern machines with their faster networks are uh, awesome as well, okay? So, um, and that leads me to the, you know, so that when, when one PCIe, you know, times four lanes card can do, you know, eight gigabytes of data transfer almost, you know, what kind of SSD should I use? Because again, you know, there will be a bottleneck somewhere, right? Uh, and luckily Samsung has released nine, um, Samsung 980s. These are now uh, consumer or like prosumer versions. So this is not the, like an enterprise version. One disk. Uh, one terabyte size disk is currently in Amazon. It's like two hundred twenty dollars or something like that. So it's not like a, it's not like enterprise pricing. And I bought uh, ten discs for my lab, and um, and and you know so basically, and this particular disc can do the specs claim that they can do seven, uh, you know, thousand megabytes. So you know six point something gigabytes. Um, you know, or, or gigabytes per, per second. So, you know, let's talk about the units separate. Anyway, so, and you know, they're all, uh, they're not through some SATA controllers um, or, or SCSI or something like that. I don't want controllers, additional controllers or switches or networks between my disks and the CPUs. So uh, the Samsung disks have, you know, purpose-built PCIe 4 controllers in them, which connect to PCI. And PCI is connected straight to the CPU, so I don't have any fiber channel networks, any infinity bands, any 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 anything that slows me down or increases latency in between. Okay, so anyway, so one disk can saturate or not saturate, but get get close to fully utilizing this uh, promised, you know, eight gigabit gigabyte <laughs> uh, transfer speed. Anyway, okay, so uh, uh, and uh, you know these are my devices then uh, all. Um, NVMe uh, devices, and I think it's worth saying that something uh, you know, like uh, NVMe, um, it's a non-volatile memory express or something like that. That protocol is like a universal protocol; it's a standard protocol. So when Samsung builds a disk, they will have a controller in it which speaks this protocol, and when um, you know some other vendor builds a disk which is an NVMe disk, it speaks the same protocol. Right, so it's almost like with SCSI and so on. So you know, I don't have to install Samsung drivers or any you know like other Western digital drivers because they all speak the same protocol, right? And um, this protocol is designed uh, to 
let's see if I talked about that as well. Um, so I mentioned here, uh, this protocol NVMe is designed to have uh, extreme uh, um, queuing capability in the, inside the disk if needed and multiple separate IO queues which different CPUs can use independently. So we are not going to have a single IO queue, you know, in the in the controller, in the disk, which where you have some contention, you know. Uh, so so there is NVMe has um, this whole protocol has a lot of. Uh, it's not only about latency, latency of, of SSDs. You know, obviously latency of SSDs is great, but it, this protocol is also about being able to do a lot of concurrent I.O. You know, your SCSI drivers will just ex explode at some point <laughs> or implode if you want to do as much I.O. as I'm doing. Okay, so anyway, so uh, what else? I ran a single disk, uh, disk test with, um, with FIO. So I'm using the FIO uh, I.O. benchmark tool, right? So this is open source and it's a very flexible tool for doing all kinds of different I.O. And um, you can read the details yourself, but I wanted you first run FIO against a single disk uh, alone, hopefully not hitting any other bottlenecks, right? So, uh, uh, you know, like uh, memory uh, bandwidth limitations or what, what not. So, and it lo looks like one single uh, disk uh, can do over, over 1 million IOPS at four kilobyte size. So Samsung's website, uh, promise that they can do 1 million, you know, only one, uh, 1 million IOPS per disk, but it actually can do more, right? And now there is, I'm going to just dive into them, uh, into this, uh, this uh, section for a second or to this side. Um, okay, so if I do a pseudo NVMe list instead of just uh, NVMe list without pseudo, it can read extra items information and um you know one thing um, well i'm not calling it cheating yet but let's see how it uh, you know if what my future tests show but you know i got more iops out of this disk than samsung promised however you see when you look into the usage so these disks are you know one terabyte each and half a terabyte each but um, you see i haven't actually used them for almost anything yet I've only, you know, the only writes that showed up here are because I created a logical volume here and maybe the logical volume manager wrote something in here, right? So I haven't actually used this disk yet at all. So there is a chance that, uh, that, uh, that this controller, you know, when I'm doing random reads across, when I'm doing random reads across the disk, uh, then, uh, you know, if the disk controller knows that the whole disk is unused, then it doesn't actually go and try to read anything from this flash location. So there is a chance that this will actually drop to the promised million number or closer to that once I actually populate the whole disk with something, right? So we, we may be cheating, but you know, I would expect you still get close to this number. Anyway, so uh, that's one thing worth knowing. Um, there are optimizations everywhere. Um, and then later on, I ran this uh, benchmark with not four kilobyte block size, but one megabyte, you know, and uh, we get, you know, 6.8 uh, uh, gigabytes, I guess, you know, or, you know, if, well, if this is 6,800 millibytes, as the, you know, the correct wording would be, then if I convert this to gigabytes, then it would be 6.5 or something. Um, anyway, so there's some confusion there. Anyways, but you know, we are we are not get, getting exactly seven gigabytes or gigabytes out of it. But if I multiply this by, if I want to get the number of bytes, let's say if this is how many MIB this is, let's say, um, what is this? Uh, in I gotta print it as well, so print. Okay, well, if I just take this maybe bytes MIB and uh, multiply it by this, then it's that's how many that's how many bytes it is. So it's if I convert this down to gigabytes now, not gibibytes, then it will be seven something. 
seven point something. Anyway, so but anyway, so you see, I'm gonna get um, again. It's uh, I'm I'm getting a like, fair amount out of my PCI PCI um, you know uh, traffic. So if I if I had an older disk PCI three disk, I would get twice less you know uh, you know throughput out of it because PCI three will has twice less throughput per lane compared to PCI uh, uh, PCI um, you know four. Okay, so all right, so. Um, and yeah, so with four kilo, as I said, you know, with four kilobytes, there was one question. You see, when I did four kilobyte IOs, then it's, it's, you see, it's this also ex, ex, uh, exceeds what PCI three would be able to do, right? So wherever PCI three would max out at three point five or three thousand five hundred something, you know. So we are already exceeding this, and so PCI four is great. It was good timing, right? Uh, and um, but if I use like half a kilobyte I/O, I would still get roughly the same number I tested. So doing even smaller I/Os didn't increase IOPS anymore because I guess we are bottlenecked by, by you know that. But the disk controller, you know, disk controller is also a little CPU inside a SSD itself. Uh, I guess the bottleneck was in there, right? So um, you know, so with with half a kilobyte, five hundred twelve byte I/O, this. Uh, you know, this would be like 500 megabytes per second, but the IOPS was the same. Okay, and by the way, I had to use three worker processes because a single, because a single process were, was not able to submit and complete uh, more IOPS per second than this. So you see, when you have so fast disks like I have, so low latency, you're trying to do so many IOPS then you know, one CPU core can only submit and complete so many, you know, IOs. There is a limit. So I had to use, you know, at least three uh, processes working concurrently. You see three processes running concurrently, burning CPU, you know, I have 32 CPUs. So out of that, I used about 10% um, or 9% in this case. So there is some calculation issue sometimes, but, uh, you know, Anyway, I, I kept three processes fully busy in order to get to this bandwidth. Okay. Anyway, so um, and the, you know, I FIO allows you to run IOS. Um, you can configure different ways how to do IOS. Um, I used the latest, most, um, the fanciest block IO driver. Um, what uh, what uh, you know Linux has? It's called IOU Ring. It's like an a it's a completely asynchronous interface. So I'm not going to go deeper in there, right? But you know something like Oracle. If you think about Oracle, Oracle doesn't use this yet. At least it uses Leap AIO. So you could just replace this with Leap AIO to kind of test something similar. You know something what Oracle would use and. And the Postgres, MySQL, they just they use a different approach. I mean, they, there is some libAIO there as well, but they use like f-syncs and stuff like that. Anyway, so let's uh, let's move on. Um, it's worth saying that when I did big IOs, you see, then the CPU usage dropped a lot because again, you know, um, like why why are we having so much so much so, uh, so much? Um, you see, the runnable processes. Apparently, I put this column here. It's like almost zero. So I don't have like three, even though I ran three workers, they were mostly sleeping, waiting for IOS to complete. And so, I mean, so we did more throughput. We moved more bytes around, but the CPU usage dropped. And there, you might say that, hey, how is this possible? Like we are, I mean, the reason is this, you see, instead of doing 1 million IOPS, we are doing only 6,000 IOPS, right? And submitting IOS through the block layer and completing the IOS uh, in the OS level, you know, system calls and everything, that's what takes uh, CPU. Copying data doesn't take CPU, right? Because you only submit an IO to the storage hardware, you know, via the NVMe protocol. You will submit an IO, you will tell, okay, read this range of bytes from this offset and copy this range of bytes to this virtual memory location in the host memory. 
So who is actually doing the copying of the data? It is not your CPU. This would be crazy if all data that gets copied um, is, uh, you know, is, is somehow copied via CPU registers. Uh, so this is where DMA comes into play, right? So your your SSD, you know, your 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 SSDs have uh, DMA controllers in them. That once they know what to copy where, your SSD DMA controller gets onto the PCIe PCIe bus, copies the data. You know, it can use. Um, you know, there are like complications. There is a, there is like sometimes a. There is an I.O. memory management manager unit who can do virtual to physical memory translations for PCIe devices without bothering the CPU directly, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, so there is, uh, you know, and then, um, but anyway, at the end of the day, PCIe will, uh, you know, there may be some I.O. hub in between, but in my AMD uh, CPU, the I.O. hub is within the CPU itself, right? So it's not, um, but it's not big. It's not the CPU core. Your CPUs are not busy, but uh, your data goes through the I/O hub inside CPU. In my case, on on the CPU, you know, in, inside the CPU package, and this I/O hub then sort of routes the data to the uh, memory channel, to the appro uh, appropriate appropriate memory channel, and I have R dims. You know. I said I don't have any slides here. I just show that. But anyways, the point here is that uh, if you are doing only six thousand IOs per second, but every IO moves a whole megabyte around, it's the SSD's DMA controller who only has has to do this. You know, it gets six thousand requests, and then every request the controller copies a megabyte from here to memory, right? So yes, your DMA controller is really busy. Your PCIe network is busy. The IO hub hopefully has enough, you know, it probably has enough uh, bandwidth to deal with this, depending on how many CPUs or how many, how much, how many concurrent copies you have. And, you know, memory again. So this is where the memory channels come into play as well. So if you have 10 disks like I have, but you only have one memory channel in use because you have only one DIM installed, well, you may have a bottleneck here, right? But anyway, because we because in this uh, case we are not doing millions of IOPS, we are doing only six thousand. That's nothing, you know. That's why the the CPUs are um, you see they are pretty idle here, you know, because we only had to submit, we had to enter and go through the bl the block layer only six thousand times per second, um, or actually you see it looks like it's thirteen thousand times per second because Apparently, my megabyte size IOs were split somewhere, you know, in the kernel, or maybe FIO uh, wasn't even issuing one megabyte size reads. So I, I asked for one megabyte at a time, but actually, at the block layer, what got submitted to the device was was half of that. So that's why. But it's still sixteen thousand block layer visits. It doesn't use that much CPU compared to doing this a million times every second. Okay. So, but we can we move much more we, we can move much more data because it's not the CPU itself who does the movement. And hopefully, this here kind of starts illustrating how your your um, CPUs are um, or not CPUs how your computers are networked, right? PCIe, you know, uh, can be a bottleneck, right? Your DMA controller can be a bottleneck. So the, I, I explained this in my blog entry. It's the same thing. Had I bought somebody else, some other vendor's SSDs, there are some SSDs apparently out there who claim that they are PCIe 4, and it looks like PCIe 4, but they have old controllers from five years ago in there. And the old controllers are, were not built to, to handle and copy data fast enough. So you know, so you have to, in order to have a balanced system, you have to make sure that all that you have enough of all of these channels, lanes in your networks, and and the controllers in between are fast enough as well. Similarly, you know, you may know from past, if your storage array, if your storage array is slow, it's not always necessarily because the disks are slow in it, but maybe the controllers inside the storage array who do, you know all the I.O. lookups and the thin provisioning lookups and um, 
you know, RAID 5 computations, blah, blah, blah. The controllers are busy. So the CPUs inside your storage array are fully busy, not the disks, right? So if you have a, you know, depending on if you have what kind of storage array you have. Anyway, moving on. So we just know, we know how much IO a single disk can do. Over 1 million IOPS, small IOPS, or 6.8, you know, giga, gigabytes or whatever we call them today. Okay, so, and um, um, I had to use direct IO. Well, I already, because of my database background, I knew that I would need to use direct IO um, at the OS level instead of cached IO because otherwise, you know, if you want to do millions of IOPS and you want to go through the operating system, file system cache, you know, the OS file system cache or page cache as we call it in Linux. If you want to do it a million times every second, well, that's going to mean that you're going to visit the, the caching layer code path in the kernel a million times. And that will give you this. You see, I only ran um, uh, with three worker processes, I think. Uh, but I somehow got a 100% kernel mode CPU usage. And I got a lot of trades, right? So it's like, I only have three trades or three workers in, um, in FIO. But when I use FIO without direct IO, when I go through the OS page cache, I got like a lot of trades trying to be on CPU, you know? And then you either run, you can run top, but you know, this is a good chance for me to introduce or reintroduce PSnapper, right? So when you run PSnapper, you see that the FIO trades, I don't even have three FIO trades. Like I should, I would see 3.0 here, or if I added this together and that together and so on, um, or anybody where it shows it's on running on CPU. That should be three if FIO were fully running on, on the CPUs or all three workers, but apparently not. You know, I get like, if I add this together, um, it's less than one on average or in, in total, out of this, you know, when I add the CPU usage of all these three threads together, it's less than, you know, less than one. It's, it's keeping less than one CPU busy with file. But, uh, but these guys, you see 20, close to 24 kernel threads, Linux kernel threads, some sort of IO work queue worker, you know, uh, there is a number here as well, but by default, I just replace it with some, you know, a star just to collapse different, um, you know, if you have multiple different, multiple trays doing the same thing, essentially, I just collapse them together, right? So I have some Linux kernel trays doing work for me, right? And whenever this WChan shows up, wait on page big to come on, that usually means that there is some buffered IO related contention, right? Either we're waiting for some other thread to read a buffer that we also want to read and, and so on. But anyway, so this is the first, um, like, we're not, not, this is one of, one of the OS level things I wanted to say that um, sometimes there is um, complexity arises uh, when you do IO. So uh, when we did, um, when we did um, direct IO, you see, I only have I only have file threads. Okay, actually, sorry, you know, I, I only wanted to list file. I don't see any other threads here. But but I can tell you that when I ran my tests, kernel threads didn't show up, or like additional kernel threads because we did direct I/O. It was the file process that made a system call, and that system call went uh, directly into the kernel and went all the way to the block device, you know, and submitted the I/O to the NVMe device. So there is a very simple like one-to-one -one mapping. I have like three processes and you know, all three of them directly talk to the IO disk devices. I don't, I don't spread out processing to additional threads on the way. But here, because I'm, I'm, I'm now, I'm not using uh, direct reads, I'm actually complicating things. I wanna go through OS cache. I wanna go through OS page cache and get everything that the OS page cache does, cache does, you know, cache replacement, uh, prefetching, you know, like stuff like that. Um, and for that, 
Oracle, or not Oracle, <laughs> for that, Linux uses additional threads, apparently, under the hood. And now, um, I don't know whether this is a bug or, or some, some tunable, or it's just unfortunate when your disks happen to be that fast. Uh, I have like, what is it, 60, I have like 83, 84 threads uh, apparently active, you know, trying to do stuff, you know, so running on CPU, walking through page cache, perhaps, and some some are actually have submitted I/O and now they're, now they're waiting for the I/O to complete or 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 actually this in this case uh, they are waiting for somebody else um, to complete the I/O and so it's it's kind of um, a bit complicated. So this um, and when I add it to the kernel stack here, uh, if you, s you have to scroll right a lot, you know, let's say this disk here. So this is the Linux kernel um, functions. And apparently, you see uh, the the ones. So these these guys waiting in uh, in this disk mode, these threads. You know they are they they want to do buffered reads. And but they're waiting for somebody else to actually complete the the buffer they are trying to read, to complete the I/O for the buffer they're trying to read. And when I go when I look into somebody else, you see. There is apparently some sort of a read ahead going on, prefetching blocks. Um, and this is not a file system read ahead, but I, I don't even have a file system on these devices. Uh, but apparently, and, and a lot of uh, read ahead, you know, some threads are trying to do read ahead. And in order to do read ahead from this, they have to allocate space. You know, they have to find and allocate space from the file system cache or the page cache. Uh, you know, where to put those blocks, right? And you go all the way, right? You know, you see they're trying to free pages by shrinking, uh, you know, the LRU, uh, by shrinking or removing pages from the LRU list of the page cache. So anyway, so, and this is not even multiple processes. I mean, this is not even multiple disks. It's just three, three processes or three filed processes against one disk. So anyway, if you want to do high performance IO, if you if you actually have a system where for some reason you need to do millions of IOPS against disks, then uh, you probably don't want to use OS page cache. And luckily, it's actually not even needed really, uh, because when you think about something like Oracle or MySQL, you know DB and so on, then there is a better place where to cache stuff. You know, the database cache itself. Or some application level cache, you know, that's 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 a much better and closer place where to cache things. Um, so assuming that your application or database engine has such a thing, right? And you know, indeed it has. So it it makes sense to disable this direct, uh, you know, page cache, right? Um, so uh, uh, and use direct IOS. Of course, if you will build some other application and you don't want to build your own caching layer, then you know, the next best thing is just to rely on what the OS has to provide or OS provides to you, okay? Anyway, so, and uh, you see, um, I'm using perf. I mean, whenever you see things like, um, um, so, wherever you see this, that your kernel mode utilization is like 99% or even like 20%. If you have a well-tuned, well, well well-built system and that's that's not doing millions of IOPS, that's doing only 10,000 IOPS, you shouldn't see like 100%. You shouldn't see 20. You shouldn't even see 10% here, right? You should see a few percent in spent in sys mode, right? Uh, but when you are on a VM with crappy interrupt handling and then so on or... Um, Mm, or or you use a lot of page cache, then this number may be a bit bigger. But in any case, whenever you want to drill down into why is the kernel mode CPU usage big, then uh, then um, um, then the next thing you know on Linux, how you would drill down would be would be perf, right? You can run perf record and. Uh, or as I'll, as I'll show you in the end, so I actually have perf running and sampling at one hertz frequency. It's sampling all CPU activity at one hertz once per second. And it saves output into this separate files for every minute, right? And, um, you know, indeed, 
when I, and this allows you to profile CPU usage and you would see that, hey, indeed, it looks like, you know, out of all CPU usage, we are indeed somewhere in the page cache, under the page cache, um, you know, um, code path. But when you go deeper, you see 93% of all CPU usage, and this is further broken down, you know, 46% is, you know, put the page into the LRU in the page cache. And another 45% is, is uh, if you look into drill down, you know, shrink and so on. So half of the CPU usage is that we want to put pages into the LRU. And another half is that we want to remove, you know, pages from the LRU. That's the replacement for you. You know, we are, we are, we are throwing away old blocks so we could put in new blocks, essentially, right? And then you go deeper. So it's not even the LRU operation because you see, if you look into the big numbers, this is still 46%, still 46, still 40, you know, 45 almost. And when you go down, this is 43 almost. So, so out of this 46, most of the action happens here. Almost 43% is in native code spin lock. So it's not really, it's not really that the LRU walking or LRU operations take all this time. It's a spin lock. So, and yes, okay, why do we need this spin lock so much? It's because the LRU operations, you know, want to take it very frequently, you know, and, we, and apparently concurrently, because we, for some, some reason, we had like 80 kernel threads, you know, doing the same thing at the same time, right? And when you go down here as well, okay, 40, 44% tried to free, free pages. Go, you know, these small ones are probably insignificant, and 44% shrink LRU vector, I guess. Shrink, shrink, shrink. But when you go deeper, what is the deepest deepest step here or function in the stack um, with a big number? 41%. So 41% of all CPU usage you see here, you know, was spent down here. Again, you know, uh, it's spent spinning, right? So, and how do, you, how do you reduce such contention? Well, use it less. When, whenever you have a lock contention, you don't, you don't immediately start tuning parameters like, hey, you know, can I, how many times I spin or whatever. Start thinking about how do you use it less, right? And in my case, in this blog entry, what I did to use these spin locks less was I switched to direct IO because direct IO bypasses the page cache. There is no need to go to search for things in the LRU list. And there's no need to throw away so many pages from the LRU list. And since I do so, so much less LRU operations, I have, the, have much less reason to um, take spin locks that protect this LRU list, right? So, you know, this is, this is why you use direct IO when you want high performance IO, uh, IOPS on, on Linux block, block devices like this, right? Uh, but the other question would be, um, you know, would go back here. Let's say that I don't want to do that many, you know, let's see, what is this guy? So that, let's see, I don't want to, you know, disable direct IO or I don't want to disable page cache usage for some reason. Then, you know, one question, what I, ha what I would have in mind is like, I only have 32 CPUs in this machine and I'm accessing only three disks. Sorry, I'm accessing only one disk with three processes. I mean, why do we have so many threads? You know, because spin lock contention shows up when you have, you know, when when you have many threads, more than one thread, right? So perhaps, um, I mean, I don't know if there are parameters for tuning, but at least this evidence here hints that um, if I had less, if I had fewer threads, maybe only 16 or maybe only 32, because that's how many CPUs I have. Or maybe only three because that's how many processes currently you know are doing this work. So if I had fewer threads trying to access the same spin lock, then there would be less contention. And therefore, hopefully, this forty-two percent would drop to four percent, right? So you know, so this is how I think about things. I can I can I use the lock less by changing how the application uses I/O or whatever resource? Or if I cannot do that, then you know. Do I really need to oversubscribe? Do I really need to use 80 trades who contend for the same spin lock? Can I get away only with eight trades? And you would, we would waste less time here because that's a common thing. You know, people often want to make things better by increasing things, 
let's add more threads, let's add more CPUs, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, it would be better to decrease things, you know, because we, if you only had eight threads instead of 80 threads trying to spin for a spin lock, you know, for sure you would be spending less time for spinning because there is less contention, right? Anyway, but, but you know, you don't start fixing any of these things before you have ran perf or any other profiler which tells you the breakdown. That because, you know, sometimes it's spin locks, but sometimes it's not. Okay. So I'll skip a bunch of the other stuff what I did here. Um, similarly, um, Oracle, not Oracle, I always, I talk about Oracle so much, so that's why I say Oracle, but Linux, um, you know, uh, it has, uh, you know, it uses something called multi-queue uh, for NVMe devices always. You cannot even disable that for NVMe devices. And if it knows that the device is a, like a, an SSD, it will disable the scheduler automatically as well, right? So IO scheduler, right? So, uh, and, but out of curiosity, I was like, hey, you know, I, I know, let, let's see what happens if I enable the IO scheduler just for one desk, well, just for one disk, you know? And um, this is the multi-queue, I'll talk about multi-queue separately, but uh, multi-queue IO scheduler, I enabled it and, uh, and I got, instead of 1 million something IOPS, I got only, ha only half a million, right? And the CPU usage was, you know, the same or, you know, well, pretty much the same three processes of my file processes, right? Um, I didn't have a huge number of threads. You see, I ran PSN without any flags. It just shows me which, which, which threads with, with what name, what are they doing? You know, I didn't have a huge number of kernel threads here uh, active because, you know, I'm, I was, I was not, uh, I was not using page cache here anymore, but this, but the throughput was lower. And the reason is that, again, you know, you see, we are doing direct I.O., that's good. Um, I'm not sure how well you see that. Uh, let me just make it a little bigger. Uh, but uh, you see a bunch of, there is something that showed up in here. So you see um, a bunch of time, CPU time is spent in, the, in some sort of delays and timers and, uh, and you know, uh, things like that. You see delayed work. So... Um, so this is how IO scheduler, Linux IO scheduler does things that when it's about to submit an IO or when it's about to dispatch the IO into the device, you see, you, you submit it, you submit it uh, some, you know, with a system call, you submit, you submit the IO, uh, you, I mean, the, the application submits the IO to the kernel uh, up here via a system call, right? And this IO is inserted essentially into an IO queue, but this I but this IO from the queue is not dispatched to the actual device yet. You know, there's a difference. You know, so it will the IO stays in the queue for a bit longer because IO scheduler has been enabled. You know, and the whole idea is that for spinning disks where where you have non-uniform latencies depending on where you seek, that maybe you know maybe you can optimize some IOs by patching the close ones together and so on and you know but anyway when you do millions of iops this will cost you because all this extra logic of deciding whether to submit the uh, whether to dispatch the io to hardware you know when you do it in which order to do things and so on that will uh, um, uh, that will uh, um, you know that will that will use cpu and if you're doing only 1000 iops then uh, you know, you don't even notice a problem. But when you do 10 million, like I'll show you, or 11 million, then, you know, every extra CPU cycle burned for some magic, uh, it, will, uh, it will cost you. You will notice that, right? So uh, Oracle correctly, not Oracle, Linux correctly disables IO scheduler for where it's not needed. You only need IO scheduler when you're running against spinning disks, really. Like even if you have an EMC storage array with... A lot of spinning disks in them then you still can get away without having an io scheduler because you can submit the ios to the storage array at whatever order you want and the storage array itself can rearrange the ios as, as it sees fit so really if you're you know if you only are running on local spinning disks without any controllers in between that's when you need this stuff right uh, but but the, you know with modern systems with fast io uh, 
if it's enabled somehow for you, then this, make sure you disable that, right? Okay, multi-disk test. So how can I how can I plug in ten disks into my machine? Well, there are different vendors. I mean, there are plenty of quads SSD adapters. So you see, you can add, add more four M2 SSDs on one adapter, right? And it's uh, and there I had to set config some things in BIOS. And you have to make sure that when you buy an adapter, it's actually a PCIe 4 one, right? So that you're not buying some, you know, you don't want an artificial bottleneck, you know. You have all these four disks that are really fast, but if you put the old adapter, you know, you may have a bottleneck somewhere, you know, in a, in a chip, in a controller somewhere here, right? So, and, uh, you know, there's something called PCIe port, port bifurcation or whatever way you say that. You see, I configured that this particular PCIe 16 slot is actually four, it looks like four separate X4 slots to the, to the OS later on, right? And I had to configure it to use PCIe 4 speeds, okay? Okay, and anyway, so um, what I did then, then I hit an interesting bottleneck, okay? So you see how I installed it. This is the server, right? So this is the small GPU, and I put these two. These are now the, uh, you know, two, two uh, quad SSD cards, and I had, uh, you know, two SSDs are uh, I think in here, under here. You see this little um, mm. heat sink you here have. You you know, I had two slots for SSDs on the motherboard itself. So total ten, four, four, and two up here. Okay, and um, I installed it like this. I didn't really read the documentation or hardware or anything like that. However, I only got, when I ran uh, like one megabyte IOS, I got, I think I got like about 50 gigabyte aggregate throughput. I was expecting something like 68 because if, if a single disk, if a single disk can do 6.8, then 10 should be 68 gigabytes, right? So we must have hit some bottleneck in between, right? And actually, yes. So as I mentioned, modern CPUs have PCIe lanes connected directly to the CPU. But since there are so many of them, you know, when you have 128 of them, then they are not con they are not connected through to uh, to a single uh, location on the CPU. And it depends on your CPU architecture. Like, is it the central I/O hub like my CPUs have? Or, or, you know, some Intel Xeons have actually like, you know, two um, separate uh, sets of PCIe lanes go to two ends of the CPU. You know, some cores are closer to one PCIe device and some cores are closer, closer to, to, the, to the other CPU, uh, to, to the other PCIe device, right? So, um, so there is like a lot of, you know, things to learn, but... Um, but basically, long story short, these two cards that I installed in separate PCIe, PCIe slots, they actually happen to be sharing the same PCIe lanes. You can have multiple separate cards, but they use the same PCIe lanes, right? And so the same PCIe lanes, you see uh, separate endpoints in this case. Um, so I don't have a switch in between, but you know, I had one card which was con connected to a PCIe root complex and the other card as well was connected to the same root complex. So, and I ended up saturating the throughput of that root complex connected to, you know, um, you know, uh, through, you know, um, so I had 128 PCIe lanes, but I managed to try to use only, you know, the same lanes for two separate cards, right? So basically, when you on my AMD machine, I can do this: to, to LSPCI grep root, and I see I have four root complexes with the PCI addresses. You see, and when you use LS LSPCI to show you a bit of topology, uh, you see uh, it it will uh, it, it shows you. You see, this is one PCIe root complex. The GPU, the graphics card is under that, but you see that the quad cards I had, I have, I have managed to put both of them under this root complex. So both of them wanted to do their IO traffic through the same um, lanes, essentially. 
So I hit this artificial bottleneck, you see, and uh, you know, and the two uh, SSDs which I had installed straight into the into the motherboard slot, they were on a, under a separate uh, root complex. So there was no problem here. And there is one uh, PCI root complex which that has a lot of extra stuff like you know my network card, USB controllers are here and so on. So if I put in plug in a bunch of USB disks, they would go through this part of the network to the CPU, right? So and that's why I didn't get the max theoretical throughput. And so basically all I had to do was, you know, I noticed that my GPU was, I, you know, I just moved this GPU and one of this quad cards around because the GPU was in a, in a separate, under a separate root complex, like I saw before. So, and the end result with LSPCI is this, you see? So now the GPU is under the same root complex as some of the disks, but I don't care right now, you know, because I'm not, you know, using them at the same time at the moment or not at the high throughput. And you see now these four disks are here, four disks are here. And that's when I got, you know, I'll talk about the final results in a moment. Um, you see, that's when I got, when I did large IOs, I used half a megabyte IO because the IOs were, bigger IOs were, were split into smaller pieces anyway. So, and you see, I got 66 gigabytes or gigabytes. I don't know which one, one it was, but I got 66 gigabytes, let's call it per second. Actually, it's it's 66 gigabytes, uh, and, but in gigabytes, it would be 71 even, you know, if you, if you use gigabytes in like, like network people use, you know, uh, like they do the math or the correct, you know, anyway, so, so that's now we got pretty close to the maximum theoretical throughput what this disk uh, give me. So uh, so the network layout. Remember, computers are networks. Um, the network layout matters. How many PCIe lanes you have depends on the vendor. You know, did you buy a cheap machine or an expensive server or work grade, workstation grade machine? Is it, is it AMD Zen, uh, you know, AMD old architecture? Is it AMD new architecture, right? AMD Zen 2, what I have, actually has multiple root complexes and it has, uh, or it has more root complexes than old older versions that have only two or three. Um, and also there is a CPU architecture question here that uh, uh, my AMD Zen 4 has a central IO hub inside the CPU and connect it to all cores in a symmetric fashion, as opposed to, um, you know, my Intel machines, which have two, one IO hub on this side of the CPU, one IO hub on that side of the CPU, right? And the cores that happen to be connected to this high IO hub have a lower latency and so on. Anyway, so there is a lot, lot more to say here, so, but I, will, I won't because we will run out of time otherwise. Um, so I'll show you, before I go to the IOPS and the CPU topics, so I'll show you one more thing. So LSPCI, so when I use LSPCI, I get this, but there is also, there's some, a command called LS topo, list topology. And it's, um, what is it? HW lock is the, the package is hardware location. So that's like a, a tool for mapping and showing the topology of your hardware. Right, you do LS topo. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, well, you see LS topo shows you something like, something similar like, like the LS PCI does. It shows you, the, you know, your CPU info and so on. But uh, one thing what I learned from a hacker news discussion where, where, where a lot of people kind of uh, jumped in, a lot of people, you know, who are specialized in this kind of thing. Uh, output format is as key. I didn't know that this was, uh, you know, I mean, uh, that this visual representation was 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 built into that. I had only used LS Topo without, like I showed you just just before, and this will actually show you a graphical or a pseudo graphical layout. So this is my AMD machine. It's a single CPU uh, package. It's a single CPU socket. But you see, because this is an AMD uh, Zen architecture. The single CPU socket has two, I have two NUMA nodes within a single CPU. I have only one CPU installed. If I look into, you know, if, if you go to, um, if you look into here, this here is a single CPU, but it has two fans on it, right? So they, it, like, it's just, 
it's like 280 watts and so on. And there's a lot of cooling you need to do. It's a sim single CPU. It's not a two socket machine, right? But nevertheless, it has two NUMA nodes in it because AMD's, how they built, built their Zen CPUs, um, it, they, they use something called chiplets. And I think they have like a eight CPU cores per chiplet. So I have a 16 core CPU because I was cheap. So I have two separate chiplets and connected by something called Infinity Fabric or something like that. Um, uh, so, and when I had, if I had a bigger CPU, like 64 cores, I would have, uh, I think, eight chiplets here, right? And uh, anyway, and, and uh, because this is Zen 2, I have a, a two separate level two, uh, level three caches. So four cores use one level three cache and another four cores on this chiplet use another level three cache. So this is a, in Zen 3, you know, the latest CPUs, which recently came out, Zen 3 has a unified level three cache. So you see, it's actually possible to see all these things. Remember, computers are networks. And even within your CPU, you have a network, right? These chiplets need to talk to each other somehow, right? And there is a band, there is a network, network. There is a network between CPU cores, essentially. But also, if the cores are between chiplets or separate Newman loads, there is a separate network. Like, we have a point-to-point a -point network in the AMD architecture. Um, Intel Xeons have some sort of a ring network. So... This core here, this core here ha has a lower latency when it talks to this core, but it has a higher latency when it talks to that core because there it has to, the signals have to go through a ring and so on. So it's a uh, computers are networks, CPUs are networks. And, uh, and when you go scroll right, this LS Topo even shows me the, how the PCIe devices are now connected to this mesh, uh, to this uh, CPUs. And uh, you see there is a, network card um this is the samsung these are samsung uh, disks this is the you can search you can google you know the the vendor pci vendor identifier this is a samsung vendor id i have two samsung disks here um connected to this uh chiplet and when, I, when you scroll down uh you see i have a i have four more samsung disks connected here and you see I have, I have four more Samsung disks connected you know again uh, through this root complex so these are now that different root complexes that connect to the CPU right and you see this happens to be the video card I remember you know you, you remember I moved the video card around so it was under the same root complex as, as some of my disks but you see you see the network here right so and you know, there is, you don't have in infinite bandwidth here. So let me go to my different machine. So I have another machine, which is an Intel, um, you know, this is an Intel machine. It's, it's a NUMA machine. Uh, it's actually a legit physical NUMA machine with two CPU sockets, right? Okay, it has two CPU sockets. And, um, and if I do LS Topo, But you LS Topo here, you see, I have a, I have a, I have a package zero. You see, the new one is like, hey, this is memory, and um, there's 96 gigs of memory, um, I think, you know. But there's, uh, and uh, uh, and in the same uh, new one node, <clears throat> physical new one node, I have a a CPU socket, you know, with with uh, eight CPU cores, and now you see here is another new one node where uh, I have memory, a separate memory, and a separate CPU socket. So this is a le legit NUMA machine uh, where memory, where, where, where I have two sockets with their own memory, essentially, and their own CPU. If I go back to the AMD example, you see, in the AMD example, I have a, uh, it kind of shows it different. You see, it's one package. There is it's one sort of package or CPU socket, essentially, um, but within this package, we have like, um, uh, you know, I guess four memory lanes go to uh, this side of the motherboard and four more memory lanes go to the other side of the motherboard. Um, and on the Intel machine, I scroll right to see, I also see the topology. I have one, I have one video card here and a bunch of disks. Uh, these are Intel uh, disks, I think. Um, and uh, 
or maybe it's the Intel, this is the, maybe the controller, the SATA controller or something like that. And here I go down, you see I have another video card connected here. I have two video cards in here, uh, one for each connected to each socket. And I have a quad SSD card here as well. So computers are networks and these networks have bandwidth and any network has, you know, no, no network has infinite bandwidth and no network has zero latency, right? So when you build high throughput systems, you gotta be aware of all of that. And actually it's possible to run, um, if you Google, Intel has something called, on the Intel website, you have something called MLC, Memory Latency Checker, you know, Intel MLC. And uh, um, I don't think it needs sudo, but uh, you see, this is my Intel NUMA machine. It will actually, uh, measure latencies, memory access latencies, um, you know, in nanoseconds between, you know, when processes talk to you, use their local memory versus when they use their remote memory. So this is the Intel machine. I'm going to run the same thing on my Linux machine as well. Uh, da -da -da, so dev MLC, or this is the AMD machine. So this is the AMD one okay so um, I forgot to configure this I, re I rebooted so so It needs huge pages because uh, because otherwise, if you always have a small page and uh, always have a page fault and so on, then this will distort your latency info. You always have the you know page um, page fault, you know the, the TLB lookups and stuff like that. So I'm not gonna go there. Um, anyway, so um, if I look into the latencies on my Intel machine, uh, local CPU accessing memory that's directly connected to the local CPU memory channels. 89 nanosecond nanosecond memory access latency for one memory line. And when I want to go to node from zero, node zero to access remote memory, remote nodes memory, or uh, in this NUMA topology, it's 138 nanoseconds per memory line, right? And you see the throughput as well. So this is now interesting. Um, this is almost like random, <coughs> kind of a random uh, latency really if you want to access one memory ad address. But this is now when you do actually many IO, IO operations. And you see, this is in uh, megabytes per second. <coughs> actually, mega, megabytes, not, not millibytes. And uh, you see, it's 64 gigabytes per second is local memory access. So, so uh, and when I ac want to access uh, remote memory in the second CPU in the system, it's twice less, okay? But look at that, 64 gigabytes roughly. How, how much IO were we doing? I was doing 68 gigabytes already. So it's like, you know, even if you are staying inside a single CPU core, like, um, and are able to use all memory lanes, you know, the CPU itself becomes the bottleneck, right? So you have to, you know, the topology matter, okay? And you see, even with AMD, so this is now the AMD machine, machine, apparently the local, you know, this is all one CPU, but multiple chiplets in this CPU. So you see the latency is not, a latency is actually a bit higher, but it doesn't grow that much higher when you access the remote um, chiplet, I guess, in this new topology. But um, uh, the inside the CPU uh, throughput, it's only 40, uh, 41, um, uh, gigabytes really when you access local memory you know in your local memory lanes so that's per core in the sense that uh, um, well and it's and um, and now it's um, and now there is um, there is more in the sense that uh, um, uh, like I mean is your I mean are you is your CPU using some ring topology let me just cancel it is your CPU using some ring to topology that it's that the IO throughput scales as when you use more cores or or sorry the ring topology actually doesn't scale as well so but the, or is your um, you know do you have like a point-to-point -point IO hub which is somehow like switched and so on so um, 
and you know if you if you search enough in amd websites or intel websites you will actually see published numbers that how much internal throughput the cpu has right so uh, i think um, um you know with the amd cpus had like 200 256 gigabytes total if you had a 632 core machine or something like that anyway i'll stop here so this is just um i don't aim, i'm not aiming to to um show everything to you here but i just want to show that uh computers are networks and you may hit bottlenecks in different areas of the networks including your cpu right so how, how you lay things out and how you access things matters okay so um so this is this is all about this root complex and cpu bottlenecks inside cpu bottlenecks um and i'll i want to show you so the the end result as far as iops went was where is it so the end result what i blogged about was this and let's see if we can make this better we actually can make it better so where i got to was that with my 16 cpu cores when i ran this um, script that that uh, accesses all 10 disks you see um so basically my, my script runs it ran uh, all 10 commands against different devices mostly three workers per device but since i had more cpu cores i had 32 cores i added i added uh, four workers here so this keeps all 32 cores busy um or at least it kept busy them busy with my configuration and you see uh we got 11 million IOPS, four kilobyte sized IOPS. So uh, you see, I, I was using four kilobyte sized IOPS, 11 million IOPS total, which translates to 42 gigabytes transfer per second. You know, so even with the small block size like that, you see, we need a lot of throughput in the PCI and inside the CPU. And, and th these kept CPUs fully busy, mostly in kernel mode, right? For the reasons what I talked about, you know, when you wanna when you wanna when you when you call the the block I/O Linux block I/O function so frequently, 11 million times per second, CPU utilization that will build up, or some CPU utilization will will build up. Okay, uh, so um, but so basically, my in my test, I um, my bottleneck sort of was a CPU, and remember. I'm not even doing anything with the data. Cryo in this mode, it, it just lets the disk control disk controller copy the data to RAM, and that's it. I'm not actually trying to touch the blocks. You could use Fire, you could actually add an option to Fire to compute the checksum or write your own code or something to actually read the memory, right? So, but imagine if I actually were running a database and I actually were wanting to go through the blocks and read the blocks and count something from there or look something up from there. That would mean even more CPU in the user in the user mode, right? So, you know, you know if we want to do that many IOs, we, we, we probably need more CPUs. Okay. So, um, and let me let me now show you where I got to. So I was I was bottlenecked by CPU. Okay. So I, I was bottlenecked by CPU, as you see here. Right, um, I had to, you know, sometimes I got less, and uh, well, any, anyways, I reached eleven million, and I was like, hey, that if I only had more CPUs, you know, had I bought, had I not been that cheap, and had I bought a bigger CPU, what with thirty-two cores, I would have had CPU time left here, and perhaps with more processes, I would have been able to kind of go beyond that a little, little bit as well. We probably cannot go beyond that too much because if a single disk could do eleven, a, a single disk could do one point one five, you know, one thousand one hundred fifty kilo ops, right? So we we cannot go, uh, go much higher than that. But I'm clearly bottlenecked by by the CPU. So I spent some more time and actually I read comments as well, and I saw that I I had made a silly, um, well maybe not a mistake. But, um, you know, I had made a, uh, when I ran my commands, um, you know, like later on, I, t I tested all kinds of things. I even said that, hey, don't, um, 
don't um, you know you know I, I played around with random number generators because I saw some time was spent a noticeable amount of time was spent in file uh, coming up with the next random value for the random IO right and uh, and and that also consumed CPU so I even played around with these things and what else I even disabled uh, a get time of day. So this, uh, you know, FIO by default uses um, a lot of get time of day system calls. It gets the current uh, timestamp. It uses it so it can calculate average IO latencies and min latency and max latency. I even disabled that just to use less CPU. So, you know, so to, to make a little bit more CPU available for processing block IO, you know, so, you know, so I could get better throughput. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a CPU problem for me. But I had ignored or sort of um, not looked into one, something really obvious. I mean, because, um, uh, you know, IOU ring, it's an asynchronous API, right? So you can submit many IOs. You don't have to wait for the one IO you finish in order to submit the next one. So, so it can submit, it can, it can have a thousand IOs ongo ongoing all the time, you know. Um, it's asynchronous. So and that's why I sort of like had discarded or not talked about uh, thought about batching much. So so um, after I wrote this blog entry, I also enabled batching. So this means that whenever you submit IOs, then uh, you know don't submit one IO at a time in a loop. You know you can have you can submit many IOs. Don't have to wait for them to complete. That's great. But when you do submit, submit sixteen IOs in a single system call, right? And, and now in hindsight, it's very obvious because, you know, when you're a database guy, when you fetch a million rows from a database, don't fetch one row at a time, right? Fetch a thousand rows at a time or a hundred, whatever. So, and similarly, I batched up the IO requests here. So, and, um, and, um, and now I can run, um, when I run the same command, so if I do, um, and now this is different. I was on Ubuntu, um, but here I'm uh, on, um, on the Oracle Linux 8, which is the Red Hat 8 clone, right? So sudo one SSD, no, sorry, all multi. I didn't even need to do that. So I'm gonna use all uh, sudo all, all double 4K. So this will run two workers. It doesn't run three or four. It runs only two workers per disk. So I should have, you know, um, uh, 20 processes running and you see uh, that's interesting so uh, uh, let's see what's what's going on here so uh, maybe uh, anyway so you see I have only 20 processes uh, running so I have I have over a third of CPU time is available I'm not 100% uh, busy on CPU anymore so I actually have CPU time available and um, Simply because I'm submitting IOs in batches, you see, I can do 10.7 million IOs now with having plenty of, C not plenty, but with having some CPU time available, right? So let's um, let's just run. Um, so uh, uh, and this is all because I enabled batching, um, which you know for IOs in file. Okay, so if I use all multi. This now will use keep all 32 cores busy. Uh, so I think this is where you see we get 11.3 now. So, and there is more. Actually, one thing what I had disabled, you see there is, there is, uh, there is still IO time av available, but we're doing 11, so, sorry, there is still a CPU time available while we're doing what 11.4 million IOs. Right, and you see a lot of time is spent in interrupts, hardware interrupt handling. Again, because when you are, when you are doing millions of IOs and you you set them up by, um, you set them up so that you would use um, interrupts for IO completion notification. You know, there will be a lot of time spent in interrupts. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll, I'll mention something else about that. So it baffled me on Ubuntu. Um, so 
Now, um, let me add one more thing here. When I when I when I did my blogging without patching, and I you know hit my CPU limit, then I got this. Uh, I had to also enable this, so that um, I got a little bit bigger throughput with using that. So not uh, not fixed pre, sorry, high pre. So this um, uh, marks high I/O as a high priority, and if possible, it will use polling, not interrupts, for. Uh, for uh, IO completion checking. So I, I guess, you know, we don't have enough time to explain this in too much detail, but you know, you don't, we, we don't wait for somebody to wake us up or we don't wait for the hardware device to send an interrupt to the CPU. We will just, because we're doing so many IOs, we're just pulling, checking for the completion regularly ourselves, you know, and um, so this will disable the interrupt usage if configured properly. So, uh, um, but at the expense of you see, the interrupts are gone. There is no time spent on interrupts at all. And we are getting one 11.5 million IOPS. So that's the best what I've gotten out of this system. But I had to disable interrupts and enable that instead of that, uh, uh, instead of that, um, a, a, you know, just keep um, polling. Whenever you have CPU time available, just do like busy looping on the CPU and check, actively check, don't wait for anything, actively check if, uh, or actively ask the, this controller whether it has completed another IO and another IO and so on. And so this is all obviously looks crazy that we're burning a lot of CPU here. Like we have 0% idle. Um, and where I'm getting at with this, um, let me just, um, let, me, let me show you what, where I'm getting at. I guess one conclusion for high IO performance High performance IO systems is coming in a, in a, in a moment. Um, so, if I look into if I look into volume groups, I have created a volume on uh, um, I have created a quad SSD logical volume on eight disks. So I can run this. I have a script called one SSD. You know which which will. Uh, So let's just do, let's use 32 chaps on dev um, uh, mapper. Yeah, okay. So this is a logical volume what I created in order to, uh, uh, yeah, to um, I mean, logical volume I created for eight disks. It's not 10 disks anymore, but um, And let's do four kilobytes. Uh, let's see, did I? Um, I think I have to, let me just see, let me just, uh, okay, let me, I'll just run it without, I'll run it with the interrupts for a second. Let's see what happens. Um, so anyway, so this is one logical volume and I'm running with eight workers only. So basically, um, okay, we still have interrupts here. So I think I have to, um, I want to, to show it a little differently than I planned. Okay, I think I wanted to do it like this, so that the, so this, if I run all 32 cores on the devices directly right now, I got, well, 11.3 right now, million IOPS. But the point is that, let me just run all um, single. So now I have, I don't have a, now I have one process per, uh, per um, disk, right? And I guess I forgot to disable that. So let me just, uh,
okay i removed that of course uh high priority so where i'm getting it so um if you want to use this high priority io and and not use uh, interrupts all over the place which will cause trouble for your latency and uh, you can actually you know this is how you build an I high I high throughput system that uh, you know you will predetermine how many io workers or io trades you you want to have right and you can have all these io trades fully busy on cpu so they will complete ios as fast as possible and you see we are now because we disabled the interrupts which kind of wreak havoc for any, anybody who happens to be on the same cpu where the interrupt happens all the time uh you know um, i just i dis i said okay i want to build a system that can do you know 10 million iops and i created 10 trades or processes in this case they are all burning each burning one cpu core as fast as possible so with 10 cpu cores are fully busy doing io and checking polling for completion right but i have deliberately set those aside right and now I have my remaining 69% or 70%, uh, you know, over two thirds of CPU capacity for the actual application processing, right? So I can do, you know, I did 11 and a half million, 11 million IOPS with 100% CPU with interrupts and everything. Or the other option is that you do polling, but you set aside the number of uh, processes you want to use. So I'm only using a 30% of my CPU capacity and still do pretty close to 11 million IOPS, you know, okay, nine and a half, right? So, but that's close enough, right? So, and now I can spend the remaining time actually doing something with the data and dealing with network and stuff like that. So, um, obviously there are more questions here probably than you have, you know, than you have answers right now. Um, I actually had to, you know, enable like NVMe poll queues for this to happen and so on. So anyways, there's the rabbit hole goes deeper. Um, but I wanted to show you some of these things around, uh, what, um, you know, some of these issues you may see. Okay. Anyway, so, um, let's, let's go through some questions. You know, this was, as I said, this was a hacking session and, uh, you know, there is no, there was no structure and no plan really here. Um, is it possible to format NVMe disks with four kilobyte physical sector or only half half a kilobyte you see when you do um ls scasi not, uh, not uh, lsblk lsblk minus t which kind of shows topology or something so this shows you um the physical sector and logical sector right um size if i go to my other other server you see in my other server in my intel server uh, I have a, uh, the, um, you see, there is a, the physical sector and logical sector is 512 bytes for the SSDs, but, uh, you know, that's, this is a regular spinning disk and apparently the physical sector is four, kil uh, four kilobyte for that, right? So if I want to read, or if I want to write half a kilobyte to this disk, it will actually have to read the four kilobyte physical sector. You modify the leading half a K and then you write the whole thing back, you know, so there is a, you know, you need to be aware of this. And the question is, is it possible to format SSDs to use four kilobyte by page size or half a kilobyte? It depends on the vendor. And usually, you know, it's almost like a firmware update and uh, uh, Intel Optane's can, you know, do that. I think some Western digitals can do it. Um, so it's with some SSDs, it, it, if if the vendor supports it, it is possible to uh, you know actually use four kilobyte page size. And then there are like some disks which actually use what is it four kilobyte page size, but they emulate half uh, half a k and so on. So there is more research you need to do there. Depends on the vendor. Okay. Uh, um, Stefan, you asked about this. I mentioned earlier about IO scheduler and how with for SAN storage devices, uh, you know, um, let's say LS sys so, Okay, let's do this. Pseudo find find sys. So there's this something called rotational. So if I do 
uh, grep grep dot sys devices uh what is it them um, uh, block i think no, it's, i think it's there are some sys block anything uh, q okay so this is my amd machine with only ssds you see rotational is zero for everything but my intel machine has some um has some uh, um spinning disks as well and you see rotational is one right so assuming that it's shown correctly that these disks you know are spinning disks then this is correct right so that for rotational um, uh, i think it's just scheduler not io scheduler yeah okay so let's see um and my if i look into io schedulers my my um nvme disks have none okay and uh, and the spinning disks because they are rotational they default to actually having a like io scheduler right so so I'll, so as i said if you have spinning disks you need an io scheduler well you may benefit from an io scheduler if you do random ios but if you if you have a, if you have a uniform access disk then um, you know you don't you don't really want to pay the price because access is uniform anyway regardless of location where you're you know accessing the data or where on the disks the data is right but what's in between is a storage array you know you have some EMC storage array it may actually have a bunch of spinning disks in it but it has so much magic in between then now the question is that you might actually see that it's it's it is a rot it is not rotational it's not showing as rotational but um, the io scheduler is is none or vice versa or something like that right so uh, so um but you know think about it i mean if you have an emc storage array which rearranges everything anyway internally what is the benefit of rearranging things in the os layer then ideally you would run a storage performance test right to verify this right you can you can you can change this live you can you can run file and uh, keep it running and then just echo something different in here and see how how you get a difference but you know if you have a storage array that's shared by many others and the workloads vary in the storage array then it's it's hard to do you know consistent tests of course but uh, um you know uh, if you, but so but on you know, if you are doing a thousand iops ten thousand iops against your emc storage array you might not care because the cpu overhead is not very big right but if you wait start thinking about hundreds of thousands of iops or millions then then you probably would want to use uh, you know none uh you know uh, so okay and there is one question that why why is that um uh, there is an option called no up it, there is no none but there is no up it depends on your kernel version right so uh um if you go to There is no none, so this is a red that this is an older cursor kernel. Um, you see, okay, there is no up here, you see. So it's like you know, older curl. So this is a you know, very old kernel, right? So uh, these things change, you know, with, with with kernel versions as well. They have like phased out some something and phased in something new, okay? All right, so. What kernel versions was I using? So, um, mm, actually, this leads me. Even though I'm over time, I'm gonna say one more thing. So, uh, this is uh, the, um, this kernel. Um, that's the Oracle Linux with the enterprise. What is it? The UA key uh, enterprise unbreakable kernel, whatever uh, six. But it's this Linux kernel version. Uh, but in my blog, I was using a five point eight. But I also te tested 5.11 and so on. But uh, 5.8 gave me the best performance. 5.11 was had a bit more higher over overhead per I/O for some reason. Um, and one thing what I want, what I forgot to say, what I wanted to mention, is uh, is this. Um, I was using uh, I was using. Um, Okay, so 
we are polling Gaia, we are not using interrupts, okay? Um, I'm gonna remove this, now we go back to the interrupt paste. So, you see, with interrupts, you see, with interrupts, it's the same script what I'm just running, one difference. You see, with uh, interrupts, uh, well, it still it gets a uh, similar trouble here, so that's good. Anyway, but you see, the interrupt usage shows up here, okay? Uh, so this is uh, this is now uh, this shows up here on the kernels. Uh, let me just see. I always forget what the what the heck the Ah, so maybe it wasn't the IRQ, maybe. I don't, I don't know what, maybe it's a demo effect. I, I don't know why, why I'm not able to see that right now. Anyway, so there is a config flag which tells you whether, whether um, interrupt accounting is enabled or not, right? And I, you know, like I was, um, uh, I guess I've been spoiled with the enterprise-like, you know, Red Hat-like Linuxes. This is always enabled, right? On Ubuntu Linuxes, even if you install Ubuntu Server, in Ubuntu 20, Ubuntu 18, I think as well, I, I haven't tested lower. This is disabled. So you don't actually see hardware interrupt timing. In Ubuntu and that, you know, it may be like, you know, with perf I saw that interrupts were, you know, took CPU time, but uh, but it didn't show up in here. So that was confusing at first. So I'm going to blog about it. Uh, so I'm not going to try to look it up. So um, so that's that's something interesting as well. Okay. So what else? Uh, Mike mentioned that, um, actually, let me move the um, uh, Slack here now. So I hope I have answered everything in the, in the um, GoToWebinar chat. Um, but yeah, so that uh, apparently, you know, there is, a <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember that. When you run uh, NVMe, when you do NVMe list, so let's just keep hacking, you know, you do NVS, NVMe, Let's do sudo, right? So that's, you know, just tells you some metadata. I don't know if that uses show regs, but you can do NVMe show regs. And I think uh, it's uh, capital H is the, is the um, human readable option, which, uh, okay, you gotta show the device as well, right? Dev and me, right? You pick a device you wanna look into. And okay, so that's, um, so this may be, um, I think, um, let me just do this on a different machine. So there is a, the Linux kernel has nowadays, uh, you know, there is the kernels, there's all, all kinds of kernel security options, which don't, don't allow even root, you know, you can, uh, even as, a, as root, you might not be able to access, you know, your PCIe devices directly and, you know, that space. Um, let me just run it on my older machine where I, um, so NVMe, huh? 
Oh, I'm doing something wrong, so maybe. Anyway, so uh, so that there is a command that allows you to kind of show you know stuff like what what is your cap capability. Actually, here you go. Right, so um, I'm not sure. I you know I'm not sure why it didn't work for. Okay, I guess I know. Um, let's see. Let's see if I just go straight to this device. Um, Weird. Uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll, I, I had the same problem on my other machine, and I had to disable some kernel level. Um, it's not it's not the same thing as secure boot, but um, kernel lockdown. It's called a Linux kernel lockdown. So there is a um, you know it, it can cause trouble for BPF scripts as well, I think, and so on. But anyway, you see, if you want to examine your NVMe disks, things like like Q, maximum Q depth allowed in, in for your disk and so on. You can kind of query it like this, and apparently there's a page size thing, which tells you that the, uh, uh, that the, the device is okay. That's cool. So I didn't know that. So the the page size itself is four uh, kilobytes, and uh, you know this is like if you shift there is this m what is it maximum data transfer size. It's four kilobytes shifted, what is it, right or left, whatever. <laughs> shifted to to a bigger number by seven bits, right, or seven orders of, of, of seven binary orders of magnitude, or whatever way you, way you say that, and that's uh, so the maximum transfer size is half a megabyte, and that's why possibly my IOS were split split into half a megabyte sizes, even though I requested one megabyte. So you know the block layer can can do that, um, and actually let me let me uh, stop here now, um, so. So the peak random uh, read bandwidth was, uh, you know, uh, 11 and half, 11.5 million IOPS with this size, and it was like 43 gigabytes per second with this block size. You know that when, and when with 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 this block size, it was you know, eight times less gigabytes per second, right? Um, but it was still 11 and half. Uh, um, only I think I got to 11.6. Um, I uh, you know uh, let's let's just do that as well then um, all multi just that many bytes right eleven point four but this is with interrupts so let's disable that so let's see how how wild we can get uh, go or uh, but um how far we can take this. Okay, without interrupts, we get to 11, and I think I saw 11.6 as well that summer, but uh, but you know, that's pretty much the max uh, capability. So that uh, um, even though you see the gigabytes per second is only five gigabytes per second. So I, as far as PCIe throughput goes, I, uh, you know, I could do more, but possible, and you know, as far as CPU capacity goes, you know, I could do more as well, right? But uh, actually, sorry, no, uh, because this is, um, there is no idle capacity. But uh, uh, the thing, is, and ignore this, you see, I have to look into my, you know, this is what I want to troubleshoot someday. So there is a little hiccup or hang in my system at this rate. So, um, so this is not the correct number. Um, but, uh, you know, there must be a bottleneck somewhere. And, you know, the Samsung SSD controllers likely were designed to you know, that the CPU chip or the little controller chip on your SSD disk, it wasn't designed for doing more IOPS, you know, uh, you know, per disk, because there was no need really, because it was, you know, designed for four kilobytes, perhaps as the smallest size. At this rate, doing 11 million IOPS, it becomes a CPU problem when you go through the block layer, because the Linux block layer has to de do a lot of things, you know, even if you bypass the file, uh, file system cache, block layer has to worry about a lot of things, you know, uh, because the same block layer is used for spinning disks, for your USB disks, for your EMC storage arrays, for your NVMe disks. So the block layer has a lot of CPU overhead because of that, right? But uh, in the future, I might do a lot, another uh, hacking session. Uh, there are people who bypass block layer. They are communicating with PCIe devices directly. So if you, if you, 
spdk.io. Go to spdk.io if you want to learn more. There is somebody even wrote the blog entry where they did that many IOs. They had many more CPUs. They had like, um, not CPUs, they had uh, like 24 SSDs, I think. And they con they talked via PCIe, via using the NVMe protocol directly without going through the all the generic stuff of the block layer and possibly having to implement some of that stuff themselves. They did 11 million IOPS on a single CPU core, right? So it is possible to go take this much further, but you know, there will be a future hacking session about that. Check out upcoming events. And you know, I'm, I'm, partially, I'm doing this stuff partially for fun, but, but the business part is that uh, you know, I, I am a consultant and, um, and, um, and a trainer as well. So I've been doing training for over 20 years um, and I have my own material and everything, right? So, and uh, it just happens to be so that in a one and a half months or so, I'm going to start a full week Linux performance and troubleshooting class. And we'll talk about stuff like that. Um, not only IO, right? So this is pretty deep. So, you know, we, we want to be more practical in this class, but uh, we'll, um, we'll talk about things like start starting from this, that, you know, the old school sysadmins looked into system-wide counters, but I think, in the, I think in the modern day, we can approach system performance in a different way. You know, do drill down analysis on one, what the system trades are doing, you know, in either application trades or the kernel trades and so on, and drill down from there and really don't, not worry about ratios, ratios that much. Um, these are secondary metrics. The primary metrics are where time is, is going when your trades are doing stuff, right? So check that out. Uh, and you know, uh, that w anybody who attends the training will actually get the downloadable personal videos of those tra this training you know, after it's done as well. And, you know, you can retrain yourself forever if you want to. Um, 